If you've launched an app to zero customers, then you've made the classic mistake that many first-time founders make. But this book, the SaaS playbook, completely changed the way I build apps, and now I'll never launch to zero customers again. In this video, I'll break down the five biggest lessons that will drastically increase the likelihood that your next product succeeds. The biggest mistake that first-time founders make is not lack of skill, not lack of hard work, it's that they built something nobody wants. When I first started building apps, I did exactly this. I spent 12 months building something that sounded great in my head, but had no basis in reality. I'd built up this image of how customers would love the product, how successful it was gonna be, and then launch day came and nothing happened. I didn't validate and I didn't talk to customers. I was leaving it to pure luck. And this brings me to the first point of the book, removing luck from the equation. If your marketing strategy is just posting on Reddit, Hacker News or Product Hunt, then you're relying purely on luck to your product's success. But you're willing to spend 50 to 100 hours building an app based on chance. Why are we so reckless with our time? These are the sorts of questions that I've had to ask myself. And I think what it comes down to is we do the things that tend to be most comfortable. And as software engineers, writing code is comfortable and marketing and talking to customers is really uncomfortable. So we need to get into this mindset of doing the things that are actually the most effective, not the things that are the most comfortable to do. But what we tend to do is we go straight into the build and we tell ourselves, you know, I'll post on these websites and it will go viral. I'll even build virality into the app. But this is all baseless if we haven't validated and if we haven't spoken to customers. But what if we can't find any customers for our idea? Well, great. That means we haven't spent 100 hours building an app that nobody wants. So move on to the next idea. If you can't find customers now, you won't find customers when you have a finished product. So validate first, talk to customers and don't waste all of that time writing code for nobody. So after reading this book, here's exactly what I've changed before I write a single line of code. First, I validate that a customer actually exists and you can do this through keyword research, looking around the internet on different forums or websites like Reddit, just to see if people are talking about the actual problem. The second is that those customers must be willing to talk to you or take an action Customers that are unwilling to give feedback are useless to us at this point because we need that customer feedback to guide the direction of the product. So we need to find customers that we can reach out to, maybe on LinkedIn, customers that will reply to us, or customers that will take an action like sign up with their email newsletter to a landing page that we've built. We need to build up the confidence that there's already customers waiting for our product to be ready. This means that when we're in the trenches and things aren't going well and we're not feeling too motivated about the product, we're way less likely to quit knowing that there's people waiting for the product to be finished. So before you write a single line of code, validate that there's customers, validate that there's an actual problem that needs to be solved and don't waste hundreds of hours building something nobody wants. The next point I wanna talk about is something called the stair step method. Now, a lot of people see SaaS as this really easy thing to implement. There's a lot of people online saying you can just build an AI product in a weekend and then make millions of pounds. This is not the reality. The competition in SaaS is fierce. But what people tend to do is, with little experience, go directly into building a SaaS and inevitably fail. The reason is that SaaS is not special, it's just a business like any other. And if you can write code, it doesn't mean that you have great business experience. So you need to pick an earlier stage product that you can build up the confidence before you actually go in to building a full-blown SaaS. For me, that was Chrome extensions and online programming courses. These things aren't gonna make you rich, but they will at least give you the confidence to understand how a tech business can work. Now, when I do approach SaaS, I have a far better understanding of the skills required to run a tech business. Because let's be honest with ourselves, it's not the tech that's holding us back, it's all of that other stuff, the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. So stop focusing on just the code and focus on the things that are the most effective indicators on whether a business will succeed or not. So if you're brand new to online businesses, pick a simple business with a single marketing channel. This could be Chrome extensions, an online course, Shopify apps, Heroku apps. A lot of these have an audience built in, meaning you can have a single marketing channel and advertise through their built-in marketplaces. And they typically have far less moving parts. So these are a great way to sharpen your skills before you finally move on to a full-blown SaaS product. The next point is getting to a customer feedback loop as quickly as possible. Now, the book covers a lot about talking to customers, both before you even write a single line of code and then once you actually have an MVP ready for customers to see. You wanna to get to MVP as quickly as possible so you can get into that feedback loop of guiding the product based on the customer's feedback. It's best to just assume that all of your ideas are just bad guesses and only through talking to customers 
and hearing their feedback can you actually choose which way the product should grow? A lot of times talking to customers will give you ideas that you'd never otherwise think of. And these are the biggest movers of whether your app will succeed or not because they're actually solving a real world problem. This means reduce the scope of your app, focus on one or two key features, get the MVP in front of the customer as quickly as possible, and then talk to them, get feedback, make a change, and then just repeat that loop until you have good product market fit. Now compare this to what you typically do. You come up with an idea, you think it's great, you just build it, you put it out there, you post it on Reddit, and nothing happens. Think of how that compares to bringing customer feedback into the process every step of the way. You can already imagine the difference would be massive. Now this follows on to the next point of actually asking the right questions. So we've spoken about talking to customers both before you write a line of code and then when you've got an MVP. But what kind of questions should you actually be asking your customers? So there's two different kinds of questions that you can ask. Open-ended questions and would you call it like closed-ended questions? But the point is an open-ended question takes your product out of the equation. You're just trying to get to the root of the problem. So one example of an open-ended question would be, what problem were you expecting the product to solve and how did that differ from reality? Or to try and see how important the problem actually is to the user, you can ask them questions like, how else have you tried to solve this problem and what other solutions have you tried? Because if something's just a little bit annoying and customers haven't actually tried to solve it any other way, they're then far less likely to actually wanna pay money to you to try and solve that problem. Avoid questions like, do you think this product could help you or do you like my product? Try to remove the focus from the product and focus on the customer's problem instead. You don't want customers to give you biased feedback because typically people are just trying to be nice and if you say, do you like the product? They're far more likely to just say yes. Now this book is of course called the SaaS Playbook so it focuses heavily on SaaS and particularly B2B SaaS. So the next point is to focus on B2B. Now this isn't really something I thought of much before but you might have heard the common notion that it's easier to sell a thousand dollar product to 10 people than a ten dollar product to a thousand people and you hear the same with youtube as well like it's easier to get a million views on one video than ten thousand views on a hundred videos now the same is true for SaaS, and b2b SaaS is typically a higher ticket item which means that it unlocks more marketing channels like warm or cold outreach you can spend more on ads and still remain profitable and typically the margins are much higher with b2c you typically rely on a lot more on luck as a factor for the product success i'm not completely against b2c and i'm not saying don't do it but this book has really opened my eyes into how much control i could have and how much easier it is to actually sell to say 100 customers than 10,000 customers. For this reason, I think products around the 50 to $150 per month range are the best way to go. That's high enough that you can have a profitable business with just 100 customers, but low enough that you can sell to solo or small businesses. The reason you wanna be targeting small or solo businesses is because there's typically only one decision maker that you need to convince to actually start using and paying for your product. So I think 50 to $150 is like the sweet spot for that. So those were the five key learnings from the SaaS playbook. I've read this through twice now and there's way more that I could talk about. But if you do wanna check it out, I've left a link down in the description. It's called the SaaS playbook by Rob Walling. If you like this video and wanna see more like it, please like and subscribe and let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you in the next video.